Thanks again for everyone being here. I uh, am Dan with EESI. Um, we are celebrating our 27th uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum and Expo. We're also celebrating our 40th year doing all of the stuff that we do here at EESI, which is very exciting. This is panel three of seven. So we've already covered energy efficiency in rural and tribal communities. Now we're gonna get into energy system modernization. So, you know, no big thing. Uh, and then followed uh, by sustainable transportation, renewable energy, workforce development, and national security and resilience. We have a tremendous lineup. Um, we are also expecting a special guest to join us at some point. Um, I would like to start by uh, saying a thank you that I um, just want to, trying to spread my thank yous out over the course of the day because I have so many. Uh, we are treated to being in this room as well as the Rayburn Foyer uh, because of the uh, great support from Representative Paul Tonko and the Sustainable uh, Energy and Environment Coalition. He's also a member of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus here on the House side. So just wanted to acknowledge uh, that he was uh, instrumental in helping us get this, which is kind of the perfect place to have this event. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce each one of our tremendous panelists. They're going to have about five-ish minutes to let you know what they think you need to know for the rest of the panel. And then we'll have some Q&A. We'll do our best to wrap up on time. Uh, but I, uh, if you would like to learn more about them, uh, again, we have the exhibit space. We'll also have a reception at the end of the day uh, today in the Rayburn foyer. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. All right. Without any further ado, our first of five esteemed panelists. It's Alejandro Moreno. Alejandro is the Associate Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Alejandro, I think this is the first in-person briefing you've done with us for a while. I think they've been online mostly lately, so it's great to see you in person and take it away. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Um, probably, if you're like me, wondering what that title means. Um, I am the senior career um, federal officer in the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And just out of curiosity, since we're starting a panel, raise your hand if you've heard of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Oh, that's good. Wow. All right. <laughs> so you don't really need me to tell you that we are the closest thing to, a, to the government clean energy innovation hub or, or tech hub. Uh, and we're responsible for the R&D for the vast majority of the technologies that you think of when you think of sort of the future of, of the energy sector, wind, solar, all, all renewable power generation, also transportation and fuels, EVs, biofuels, hydrogen, uh, as well as building technologies, industrial technologies, and, and just for good measure, all of the advanced manufacturing work uh, that the department does. Um, but really the, and I should say, we are also the steward of the National Renewable Energy Lab. And I'm assuming if you've heard of EERE, you've certainly heard of NREL and, and the incredible work that they do. Um, with the focus on sort of the modernization of the energy sector, the, the real message that, that I want to give today is that the energy sector is changing. You probably don't need me to tell you that if you're in this room or if you just go out on the street or drive out in, um, outside of DC, you see solar farms, you see wind farms, you see EVs on the road. Um, and it's changing really fast. Um, you know, when I started at, at DOE, wind and solar were a negligible portion of, of overall generation. Now they're, they're closing in on 15%. Um, EVs are now... Um, increasing in, in double-digit percentage of sales every year. Um, solar is something like eight, a little over 80% of new power projects um, every year are solar. Uh, and it's not just here. Um, same thing in Europe, same thing in China. Um, in some cases, you know, the, the acceleration and the adoption is even faster. Uh, and government policies setting a really clear vision for the future of, of the energy sector that's really based on electricity um, and based on new technologies is really clear. Um, and the reason that you see this is these technologies are good. It's not just that wind and solar in most of the U.S. are the cheapest form of electricity generation that you've ever seen. But if you think about the future of the energy sector that's primarily based on electricity, it's deeply interconnected. You have generation and demand able to respond in a way that is orders of magnitude faster than anything that you see on the system today. You have generation that's distributed in a way that makes it, if it's designed well, particularly resilient to cyber threats, to physical threats. They can come back online in very distributed ways. 
Um, you have technologies, of course, that are clean. Not only that they don't emit climate um, change causing uh, emissions, but they also don't make our air dirty. They don't make our water dirty. They're good um, for us. Um, and lastly, they're free. The energy source itself is free and freely available. Of course, designing the technologies and developing the infrastructure to take advantage of it is not free. Um, but once you have that in place, you have effectively an unlimited free source of energy. This is quite compelling. Um, but at the same time, there are challenges to that. Um, there's real innovation that continues to need to be done to bring down the costs everywhere of technologies that, that we see, of wind and solar, to create new opportunities for generation, for geothermal, for offshore wind, uh, to continue to increase the density, reduce the volume of vehicle batteries, make it faster and easier to charge, um, to create new fuels that can, you know, without some of the, the climate change causing effects of, of fossil fuels that can get to the heat levels that we need um, in order for large manufacturing, for example, um, and in order to, to actually ensure that this innovation happens, of course, we need to support people like the researchers at NREL, the researchers in our national labs um, that are developing the new technologies every day to actually make this happen. Um, and the reason this matters so much, and this is sort of what I'll leave you with, is these changes are, are happening. And the difference between a, a energy system that's based on sort of where the, where the control is, where the fuels are, versus an energy system where the fuel is freely available, the energy source is freely available, is ultimately the people who control that, the countries that control that are the countries that have the technologies, the countries that manufacture the components and the systems, and the countries that control the supply chains. Um, and in order to do that, we need to invest in manufacturing and in the supply chains and in the research to ensure that it's our technologies that, that we have. So I'll leave it there. Great place to kick us off. Thank you so much. Or great way to kick us off. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a little covetous of your Sustainable Energy in America 2024 fact book, which apparently everyone has except for me. I don't know what I have to do to get a fact book around here. But that is a great segue to my friend Lisa Jacobson. Lisa is the president of the Business Council of Sustain for Sustainable Energy. Lisa, this is such a tremendous resource. I'm sure you're going to tell us a little bit about it. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with uh, partners and colleagues and to see all of you uh, had the opportunity to sit into the previous panel and you know that energy level and enthusiasm was terrific. So hopefully we can keep it up here for you. But you know, I know people sometimes throw around this term. I think you're kind of this expo is kind of becoming the clean energy prom, maybe daytime, maybe when we go to the evening, you know, you see all your colleagues, people we've worked um, you know, tirelessly with, and we see new faces coming into the field, and it's really exciting. So thank you for providing this platform for all of us to have conversations and to learn from each other. You know, I think myself and some of my colleagues here are really good compliments to what you just heard from Alejandro. I mean, we are the industry, the partners, the stakeholders on the other side of the research, development, demonstration, and deployment that the Department of Energy and Alejandro's office do. Uh, and there are many other offices which you're hearing from during the expo. So for the, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy itself, we are a broad-based clean energy coalition. We represent companies, and trade associations across many sectors. Our sector focuses are energy efficiency, natural gas, renewable energy, sustainable transportation, and a whole host of new and innovative decarbonization technologies. The organization was founded over 30 years ago because we knew this was the portfolio of choice. This was the portfolio that would help us modernize our energy system, would help us achieve our environmental go goals, whether that be air quality or climate change, and would help drive economic development in communities, helping support families and businesses. That's just as important today as it was then. And so our industries are active. We're active on policy. We're ha active on knowledge exchange change, and it's really an exciting time to be working with these industries. Our goals right now, clearly stated, are a competitive, clean energy America, and our industries and our members are providing those solutions to the marketplace. So 
What we work on predominantly is helping to shape policy. So I know you've heard this morning about many of the, the key federal policies that have been enacted. Those plus things happening at the state and local level are where our industries try to provide their insights. So for right now, you know, clearly things like um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the Inflation Reduction Act or even going back to the Energy Policy Act, they all took a very important broad portfolio approach to our energy modernization as a country. And so there's much work to be done to implement them. But we're also looking out at new policy areas. They're things that are new because, as we just heard, the energy marketplace is transitioning very quickly. New technologies are coming available. There are new needs that we have. And so what's nice about the opportunity now is that we can work and take advantage of the market signals that we have received from the policies that have been enacted, but it also brings to light or provides new opportunities to address policies that we might not have had the urgency or the ability to address before. So some of those uh, from the BCSE side are you know, permitting and citing reform, and we'll maybe get into some of the details of that, or if you discussed it already this morning, you know, that we have some new activity. We are hoping that that bear fruits, building on some of the reforms that were enacted in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But there's more work to be done. And you know, it's here federally, but it also, again, is at the state and local level. And picking up on one of the aspects that one of the panelists in the rural communities session discussed, there's a lot of capacity needs. So we can make reform here and we must, but we need to have that capacity at the state and local level then to actually execute and review permits, help communities get engaged in the process. So there's work to be done. So beyond federal permitting and siting, we still see really important needs for research, development, deployment, and demonstration. And we've been longstanding supporters of those federal investments at the Department of Energy, at the Environmental Protection Agency, and other parts of the federal government. So we work on budget and appropriations. We also are working actively on tax policy. And you know, we can spend more time on that. But again, implementing the really historic opportunities that we have with the new tax policies from the Inflation Reduction Act, getting those rules right is critical to delivering on the ground. But there also were things on the tax agenda that we did not have an opportunity to enact. So we want to work on those when Congress is looking at a tax bill later on. Um, I know my time is up. You know, just to say on the fact book, we are so uh, pleased that we've had the opportunity to share the fact book data with EESI's network, and this is a hard copy of it. All of it's available for free online. You can get to it from EESI or the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. But long and short, when we looked at the figures from the last year, we were astounded to see the really thriving, robust clean energy transition underway. But when you look at where we need to go. We have so much more work to do. So the partnership um, is really important to us between industry, uh, policymakers, and communities. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And we actually did a briefing with you all back yeah. a couple months ago. So that's a great way if you want to get kind of an overview of the fact book, that would be a great place to start. Next up, we have JC Sandberg. JC is the Chief Advocacy Officer for American Clean Power. JC, always great to see you. Looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just have to give Dan a little bit of a hard time in that he's had this big job for a long time. I've known Dan for 20 years, and this is the first time he's actually invited me to speak, so I don't know what that says about our friendship. Um, uh, I, I really uh, value the opportunity, and I do think the world of Dan and what he does here, and um, you're lucky to have him as a resource. I think, as you've heard from people talk about, this is an incredible time of change, and a great and timely discussion around what does it mean to modernize in this time of change. And I think as we look at this, um, it's important to think about a couple of things. And, and I think as, as, as first, I guess I should start by, uh, I'm in a testimony mode. When I testify, I never introduce our association. But we, uh, American Clean Power represents utility scale development of, of renewable energy. So the people that make it, the, the equipment, the people that put it in the ground, the people that finance it, the people that buy it, and we'll hear a little bit from Bryn about the corporate side of that as a big part of our market, but also the utilities. And all that kind of comes together under run roof across technology of solar, wind, both on and offshore, batteries, transmission. Our members develop hydrogen, so we're on the green hydrogen side as well as we look at that. So that's a little bit about us, a very large uh, trade association in that space. So 
as we look to decarbonize, kind of, and to, and to move this ball forward, how do, we, how do we do those things? How do we decarbonize? How do we modernize while, while we depoliticize? So kind of, this has become such a political hot topic, and um, for a lot of reasons, which we could take a lot of time unpacking, we won't hear today unless Dan wants to ask the question. <laughs> but I think what, really depoliticizing, a kind of this energy transition and clean, safe, reliable, secure, affordable, all those things, those aren't political buzzwords, those are kind of economic, kind of American buzzwords. And so how do we kind of take the political nature of this as, as we move forward? I think energy policy is, you know, largely for, for years and years, um, with some exceptions, notable exceptions, is largely been made through the tax code. And so um, the, the latest round of that was the Inflation Reduction Act, and that is driving modernization in the marketplace. That's driving um, a reinvestment in American manufacturing. It's driving a renaissance in deployment. But all those things don't happen without a couple of important pieces. One is the government partnership, right? Is government also moving at the, spa the speed and, and, and scale um, both to not just to modernize but also to innovate? And I think Alejandro's group is really working at that. I think sometimes when we get into the kind of nitty gritty, as Lisa knows, of how do we implement the tax policy and the tax code? I think we have bogged down a bit as we try and um, engage voices of many different constituencies, right? And so, but at the end of the day, um, a willing buyer and a willing seller have to engage in, in, a, in a commercial transaction to make that work. And all the ecosystem around that, the people that finance it, the people that have the idea in the beginning, and then also the state, local, and federal partnership among government, that all has to come together in a way that sometimes I think government has to work very hard to be in the right place at the right time. And so I would say um, the current administration has been working really, really hard um, in partnership with many constituencies to make that happen. And at the end of the day, I think that's what matters, right, is that all these groups are coming together with one common purpose, and that is whether you call it modernizing or it's transition or whatever the term you want to put to that. Um, we're happy to be in the middle of that. And um, uh, again, I want to just thank Dan again for being here, and I'll look forward to questions. Thanks, JC. I think the real reason why is because Bill Parsons wouldn't let anyone else take his spot. Um, um, but uh, it's great to have you on the panel. I think Bill. it does go back 20 years. I think it might even go back... Yeah. We used to, I don't want to derail this, but we used to greet each other by, I would say, hello, Newman. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, for years. Um, so, sorry, Bryn, uh, <laughs> you have to lead, follow that. But um, our next panelist is Bryn Baker, Senior Director of Market and Policy Innovation for the Clean Energy Buyers Association. Bryn, welcome. Turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, this is my first year, but I've had other colleagues attend before, yes. so hoping it's a long tradition. Um, I, I'm with CEBA, the Clean Energy Buyers Association. It's a customer group. So we're sort of the, the buy side to JC's group. And, and many of Lisa's members are also in our coalition of about 400 members who collectively represent about $15 trillion in market cap. So a tremendous amount of market pull, a fifth of the Fortune 500, businesses from every major sector. And these are energy customers who are also going to the market to ask for clean energy, clean electricity. They've contracted for about 80 gigawatts of carbon-free capacity to date. That's over the last 10 years. And that's equivalent to about 40% of all the wind, solar, and battery capacity that we've deployed in this country over the last 10 years. They are making their market demand clear. At the same time, our members are the same businesses, the economic engines that are adding tremendous amount of strain to the grid by asking for new electricity adding demand to load. So we've all been talking for months about the almost exponential growth in AI. That's a huge piece of this, and it is a strategic imperative that AI training and development happens here. But actually, reshoring of manufacturing is a bigger source of demand and a longer one. And then add electrification on top of that. It's, you know, some estimates are putting manufacturing at 35 gigawatts of demand just over the next five years. You know, to put that in context, that's at, you know, collectively across all of this projected demand, that's like adding four New York cities in the next five years and something roughly the size of Texas in 10. And that's mind-boggling. There's a reason we're struggling with that. But the reality is we've, done, we've seen these growth rates before. We've built infrastructure at this pace before, but it does require 
exercising planning and permitting muscles that we haven't had to in a couple of years, or decades, rather. And so, you know, this is a challenge, but it's fundamentally a tremendous opportunity. We should want this economic growth here. The question is, can we give these growing businesses what they need, which is affordable, reliable, and clean electricity? And I think that takes us to the really important intersection to all of this, which is that electricity, access to electrons, is really the deciding factor right now, somewhat shockingly, to whether these industries are going to be here, whether they can grow here, and bring the jobs and economic benefits. And all of that requires that we grow and modernize and expand our grid. So part of that means generation, part of that means transmission, there's a lot of infrastructure investment that's needed. I, I want to focus a little bit on the transmission piece of this because we have got 2.6 terawatts of generation in the queues across the country. That's a, that can solve a huge piece of the generation problem. No one's arguing that all of that is viable, but it, there is generation that is itching to deliver electrons and there's demand that's itching, economic engines that are itching to use it. And then in the middle, we have a tremendous amount of friction which in large part is centered around the lack of transmission, whether it's transmission congestion or just the lack of transmission capacity. So it becomes a national strategic and economic imperative that we tackle permitting reform and build out our transmission infrastructure. It's our top priority right now from a business perspective, and we also happen to be in a really exciting moment where we've got a lot of ideas on the table with the Mansion Barrasso bill last week, We've got something to talk about. And in our view, we endorse it because it takes us a tremendous way along the road to what we need to be doing to unleash the transmission system that we need to be building. I think the urgency is, is real here, though, in the sense that these are businesses that are moving at the pace of weeks and months. We don't have years to figure out how to speed up building a transmission line in something less than 10 to 12 years. This is a problem that we need to be tackling now. And if we want these industries to be able to build here, we need to be tackling permitting reform. And we have that opportunity on the table right now. So look forward to talking about that further. Great. Thank you, Bryn. And Cheryl, that brings us to you. Cheryl Lombard is the Senior Program Director for Power, Infrastructure, and Minerals at ClearPath. Cheryl, welcome to the panel. Welcome to the Policy Forum. Thank you as well. I'm year one. So Bryn and I look forward to uh, continuing on. Yeah. <laughs> getting the message, getting the message. I'm so happy. We're inviting uh, ourselves back. We are. We're coming back. Um, I, I, it's a pleasure to go last, actually. Um, many people building toward what I want to talk about, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, ClearPath, we, um, we have a new mission statement. Uh, we are American Innovation uh, to Reduce Global Energy Emissions. And many of you know probably from our work in terms of nuclear power, um, but we also work on carbon management. We have an industrial team. As Dan mentioned, I am leading our power infrastructure and minerals, which is really a cross-cutting team uh, to support all those other things. And specifically, um, a couple of the things that I want to talk about um, is a lot on permitting reform, which Bryn just teed up very nicely. But another new strategy that we've launched that I'm leading is in terms of working with key Republican governors um, on supporting both the federal agenda, kind of building upon what Lisa said. So um, that's something we're, we, we are rolling out um, to help support this. But, uh, you know, America needs power. Uh, North America energy demands have doubled between 2017 and 2023. This has been building. Um, previously, it had been pretty flat. Um, I just moved from the great state of Arizona where I worked in terms of bringing TSMC to Arizona. So it, again, it's not just about um, whether it's data centers, it is really growing in terms of our industrial development. If we want to bring back mining, all of these things, they need power. Um, specifically in Arizona, some of the utilities are looking in the next three years at 20% growth they need to meet their current residents. And that's a lot. Um, so, you know, in terms of really focusing in today, I want to talk about the major hurdle, which is permitting. Um, more from the energy generation side is the numbers I'm going to give. It takes about four and a half years from an environmental impact statement to a record of decision. Um, that's not counting potential legal challenges, especially for these large, more controversial projects. Um, and 10% of these projects take 10 years. Um, you know, if we're supporting a clean energy transition, you know, by 2050, we're going to have to build up to 12 times more facilities. So if you look at 
those new facilities that have to go through permitting, we're potentially looking at maybe 20,000 different permits, NEPA, all the different environmental laws, you name it. Um, that's not counting the state and the local side of this. So it's just procedurally impossible. Yes, we need much more qualified people, more people doing the reviews, but we have to focus in really on being feasible. And so um, three years ago, ClearPath, our previous CEO, Rich Powell, uh, and we were endorsers of what was called Cleaner Faster. It was an Aspen report, which laid out four priorities to help with permitting. Um, the four solutions are immediate approvals, some type of just, there's certain clean energy projects in certain areas, potentially already disturbed lands, which I'll get to, um, that can just be approved. They do not have to go through that environmental impact statement process that I talked about. And again, we're not trying to bypass any type of consultation, any type of environmental reviews. Odds are those areas are already disturbed. They've already had some type of EIS. Uh, the second is some type of expedited approval. Just somehow we can speed up for certain technologies in certain areas how they can opt in. Um, the other two areas are dealing with state and local conformity. Um, how can we have, if you're wanting to get projects, you don't get so held up with state and local laws. And then the third is expediting judicial review. In our eye, some type of frame within one year. Um, we already mentioned the, the Mansion Barrasso bill, which is actually being marked up tomorrow. Mark your calendars at 10 a.m. Uh, it's called the Energy Permitting Reform Act of 2024, and yes, ClearPath is supporting that. Um, it has, I'll say, two important areas that I just mentioned. Uh, the first, they are doing what's called categorical exclusions, um, which gives certain areas already disturbed, um, they are exempt from NEPA. Then they give a cleaner site for other renewable projects. In terms of the expedited judicial review, it's a great start. The Supreme Court just did a, a case, the Compass Post case, which has arguably made it hard to define on when the clock starts running for legal challenges. So the Manchin Barrasso bill, even though this is language that Mr. Manchin had put forward a couple years ago, it is at least putting a a statutory deadline of dealing with 180 days. So we're very supportive of that. It also, in that Mansion Barrasso bill, another priority for ClearPath, um, it fixes in terms of the Rosemont decision, which is dealing with critical minerals and mining. It, it, it does solve a, a hiccup there. So overall, um, we do have uh, that markup tomorrow, but then we also have Congressman Peters and Congressman Westerman and this body that have also been talking with permitting reform. So we're very hopeful that something will move in a lame duck session. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank that you. was a great set of presentations. And we are going to transition now to some Q&A. Um, I'm going to keep an eye. Oh, looks like we have a question in the audience. Um, while Jillian is making her way over to that question, I'm going to tee one up. Alejandro, maybe we can start with you. And that is sort of what is it? I mean, We've kind of hit on this, but like succinctly, why should, and, and assuming kind of to JC's earlier point that we're going to have to work together, that different sides will have to come together, why, is, why are bipartisan policy solutions, what are the kinds of bipartisan policy solutions we should be working toward, and why should Congress sort of stay focused on energy policy, even after they've done so much in recent years, going all the way back to the Energy Act of 2020 that Lisa mentioned, but why is it so important that they, that they keep on this, keep working on this? Sure. Um, I mean, the first part of that question, it's a little tough for me to answer in part because I'm a career fed and we have to take a, a bipartisan perspective or a nonpartisan perspective. But also when I started in this field, which I won't date myself, um, but was long enough ago that, that what I work on was bipartisan. It really, um, the energy questions were really about affordability, about uh, reliability, about sort of uh, emissions and broader environmental impacts. But Basically, what people want from their energy, you guys, each of you hit on this in some way. It's you want it to be affordable, you want it to be there when you need it, and if it goes out, to come back pretty quickly, and you don't want it to hurt you, and you don't want it to hurt your neighbors. It's kind of it. And I don't, I, I don't understand how that can not be bipartisan, I guess, but um, it's, again, easy for me to say from, from the perspective I'm at. Um, the, the second part of your question, also difficult for me to answer, but for a totally different reason. I get in a lot of trouble if I come up here and seem like I'm advocating <laughs> for any right. policies, so I won't. Please don't interpret it that way. Um, 
But you heard me in my intro slip in the phrase a couple times, if the system is designed right. And that's a really big if. You, there, there's huge potential benefits to the country, to the world, to design it right. But that does and will continue to take some effort. Just some examples, you know, uh, I think Bryn or, or Cheryl talked about the transmission system. The last big package of, of um, congressional bills really focused on that. We also really need to focus on the distribution system. I think about 80% of utilities uh, know that they need to, to um, um, update their distribution system in the next few years. Uh, and doing so, it's a huge opportunity to do it in a way that really allows for the bi-directional transfer of power. Um, you guys talked about, about permitting reform, um, also really focusing on manufacturing, mm -hmm. not just how you manufacture, but also enabling us to continue to manufacture things that have never been done before. Smart manufacturing is really taking off. It enables us for even to do things you might not think of, to reshore um, the construction of large metal items like hydro turbines previously only done through huge industrial casting that has entirely moved away. We don't do it at all anymore for a variety of reasons. You can use um, additive manufacturing and smart manufacturing to bring that back home without any of the environmental impacts that drove large casting um, away. And so there are other ways of bringing back manufacturing in the U.S. by doing things better than anybody else. So. Okay. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, you, you walk that line perfectly. Uh, Lisa? Well, maybe I'll try to, so starting with the why do we need bipartisan policy, I mean, we need long-term policy, and bipartisan policies tend to stick around, and why do we need that for infrastructure and energy investment? Because these are long-lived investments, and what we're trying to do is entice more public-private partnership. I mean, the opportunity to leverage federal taxpayer dollars is tremendous when the rules are predictable. So we need bipartisan policies because they tend to be long-term investable policies. And then, well, what's the opportunity side to create a bipartisan policy? Why should people come together? I mean, just thinking about um, our annual infrastructure week, which I think is in the summer, which we may have had already <laughs> this year, but most Americans know when they drive on the highways or when they're you know, perceiving the infrastructure in their communities that those investments were made decades ago and we need to make those investments to have modern services for communities and businesses. So just our infrastructure is old and we need to make those investments. And now the challenge is to figure out how to do that equitably and in, in a fashion that has efficient construction and build, right? Um, we need to do that for people. So, uh, you know, there's tremendous opportunity to help people. And unfortunately, in the experiences we've had in the last several years with uh, weather events and other impacts to communities from climate change, uh, derived from extreme weather events, for other concerns community has, we need to have more resilience in our infrastructure and in our energy system. So that's another reason for uh, bipartisanship. And then the last, as was touched on by I think all, this tremendous competitiveness opportunities. We're not the only economies answering these questions or trying to figure out how to answer these questions. There's growing demand around the world for these tech technologies, products, and services. And the U.S. is a leader and should continue to be a leader. So there's tremendous economic opportunity and jobs. Great. Thank you, Lisa. JC, over to you. Why should Congress be focused, still be focusing on this, even after they've done so much? Well, I, I think Lisa started the discussion. I think durable solutions are the ones that are bipartisan. And I say this all the time when I speak, capital chases certainty. So you, you need certainty in the marketplace to attract capital into the marketplace. Um, and, and as Bryn outlined, I don't, it's hard to, if you're not in this space day in, day out, to understand how mind-blowing the numbers are that Bryn just outlined for you. So, the, the load growth for manufacturing and AI is, is incredible. And what it does is it makes ener um, deploying more energy not a zero-sum game anymore. So it used to be, could you, for years in the early 2010s, and maybe even before that, it was, could you beat the avoided cost of gas? So was, was that electron that you were putting on the grid, that new electron, did it, beat the, did it beat the cost of natural gas? Which was, as you all know, was becoming very prevalent about that time. That's not how it happens anymore, right? There is so much growth, load growth, that you need everybody. And you need everybody to be reliable, and you need everybody to be secure, and you need everybody to be clean to accomplish all of those goals. So transmission clearly plays a part in that. Um, deploying um, the, the capital and the resources play a part of that, and then being able to get it in the ground. So you heard Cheryl talk about it. You heard Bryn talk about it. Permitting reform is so important, and it's important 
for transmission from a federal perspective, it's important for, um, as we kind of, as an advocacy group and as an industry, go into states, how do we find that same kind of fervor to put assets in the ground? Um, where NIMBYism, I have a friend who lives in Fort Collins, Colorado. His parents, for whatever reason, signed on to a petition to stop Top Golf. So you can understand like what's happening in local communities. It's just across the board, don't build anything here. So that, that's real. How do you, in some places, I think Cheryl might have been tiptoeing toward the edge of this. How do you, or Bryn, how do you rest control, um, put it back at a state level in some places where you see large markets that are important in the states? But all those things depend on durable policy solutions, which begin and end by depoliticizing them. So that's my long way of saying that's why it's important. That's a great way to say it. Bryn, um, you've been referred to a couple times. I'll summarize and keep it broken up. The general consensus is that Washington is determining the quantum of Thank you. Thank you. And, and grid modernization in the category of costs, reliability, and, and economics. The first on the cost side is, we're doing this in the most expensive way possible right now, especially when you talk about transmission build out. That costs everybody a lot more than we should be paying for infrastructure and transmission included. On the reliability side, I mean, we seem to be one enormous storm away from billions of dollars in productivity losses. That hits all of us. It, in, it includes businesses and what they have to do to recover and provide goods and services back into the communities. Those are very visible pain points that mobilize the customer side of this equation to say, we have got to figure this out because there's just, the, the losses are, are piling up. And then on the economic development side, I mean, th th that's sort of what I opened with, but th the points here are obvious, that we can all benefit by capturing these growth industries of the future, and that requires power. But a, a simple observation is states are competing, whether they know it or not now, for attracting these mm -hmm. industries. And it's based on whether they have the infrastructure the reality is businesses and growing industries are venue shopping because they have to. And so the states that will win out on these economic opportunities are the ones that are proactively planning and building the infrastructure to capture those opportunities. Those are all bipartisan priorities. Thank you. Cheryl? Um, well said, Bren. Um, as I mentioned, I moved from Arizona. I was in a different position, but I was working not just on TSMC, but I was representing the commercial real estate development industry. And our focus was all infrastructure. It was the energy side, it's the roads, it is water for there, it is making sure you have all of that available, your tax structure, you have to be ready to go. At the same time, you have to take care of your existing citizens, back to the cost. So bipartisan legislation um, in any manner makes it lasting, as we've already said, but it's really the most important way for us to do. You can look at how the, the, the Barrasso bill and Mansion bill is moving forward. Uh, it, it, it is a deal. Not everyone likes it, but there's a little bit for everyone. Great. Thank you. And some of you may have noticed that we have a very special guest making his way I'm not sure why you were directed to go that way, Senator Wyden. Sorry about that, but story of my life. We were actually just kind of talking about you because we were talking about how most or a lot of energy policy over the years has been done through the tax code. And of course, you know a lot about that. Once upon a time, there was a little bill called the Clean Energy for America Act. That became part, a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, we're really happy to have you join us today. You chair the Senate Finance Committee. You're a senior member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. You're also in the Senate Budget Committee, which has been doing more in the climate space lately, thanks to its new chairman. Uh, so really, we couldn't have a better member of the Senate make your long way over here to join us at the 27th Annual Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. Senator, I'll invite you to take the microphone and love to hear what you have to say and what you're working on these days, and it's always really nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Well I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a filibuster-free zone, okay? And I'm juggling a lot of stuff. You may have heard that taxes will be on the floor of, uh, of the United States Senate on Thursday, and so it's really a hectic time. And I thought I'd just walk you back through a little bit of the history here. As you know, when cap and trade went down in 2010, which was the Waxman-Markey bill. That meant that we had essentially had almost 50 years worth of gridlock on climate. 
We had no border adjustment. We had no cap and trade. We had no carbon taxes. We had nothing. And I was a junior member of the finance committee. And I said, I'm going to give this one more try. And I went up into the attic at our house in southeast Portland. And my wife was kind of wondering where I was for days on end because I was up there rummaging around looking at all the writing on this. And I was struck by the fact that the tax code really was the mother load of all of the energy provisions. I mean, literally billions and billions. And it had all been subject to something foolish, even by Washington, D.C. standards. It was going to be done by extenders, which were these kind of ritualistic kind of practices, which had a shelf life, usually not much longer than a carton of eggs. So when we were hearing from businesses and industry that they wanted something with certainty and predictability, what they got were these near egg cartons of policies. And I said, we can do better than this. And I read, and I read, and I read. And I hit on the two ideas which became the foundation of the bill that we passed in the Senate Finance Committee in 2021, which was 90% of the final package. The two principles were technological neutrality, which meant that we'd have a market-oriented, private sector-driven policy without mandates, and everybody got to play. And the second part, because I knew I'd have some challenges with progressives on that, was the more you reduce carbon, the bigger your tax savings. Those are the two principles of the package that cleared the Finance Committee. About $380 billion was what we thought. And as you know, there are private sector projections now of hundreds of billions of dollars more. So clearly, the concept of trying carrots rather than sticks in an incentive-based kind of approach has gotten a big response. And second, I have a feeling that this battle is going to continue on. You know, I started it right after 2010, as I mentioned, became chairman of the um, Energy Committee and chairman of the Finance Committee. Joe Manchin invited me to West Virginia, and we essentially sealed the agreement on a vision around technological neutrality and rewards in the tax code for carbon emissions. And today, we see members of Congress, particularly some of the House Republicans, having voted against this vision, now go home, take part in the ribbon-cutting efforts at home, and somehow try to say to their constituents that it was their work that brought it all about. I got a book coming out about chutzpah, which is pretty important to Jewish people. That is chutzpah, to vote against it and then go home and say you're taking credit for it. So my hope is that we will be able to keep building on it. I continue, and I'm sorry that I'm juggling today, I'm going to continue to try to build on those two principles, technological neutrality and uh, the question of rewarding, reducing carbon emissions. And I think they have some applicability to some of the big fights coming up, transmission and permitting and the like. And I understand you all are going to be having big debates on what's ahead and listening to that. I'm sorry that I can't be for it. I can want to take a question, and then I'm going to have to zip off. But is somebody just burning with a question they want to ask? Sure. And we have a microphone that we in the room. Uh, any questions for Senator White? But I, I'm sorry that I'm going to have to get out the door. We'll take one. Okay. 
Well, while people are working up their courage, is the book called Chutzpah, or is it the about... Book, the book is, it takes Chutzpah. Okay, that's great. That's great. All yeah. right, looks like we do have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your, for your remarks. My, my immediate question is, if we have this communications divide, how do we fix that? How do we fix the messaging so the, 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 the people understand... Um, what, what is going on in Washington and how that is benefiting every corner of America. I hope that I went a ways to talk about some of the mess messaging. Carrots, not sticks. Market-oriented, private sector, technological neutrality. The more you reduce carbon, the bigger your tax savings. Look, these are not words that people talk about at every coffee shop. And I'm very much aware that I'm barely a household word in my own household. <laughs> but call it quaint, I continue to believe that policy matters. And policy is going to matter in the end. And let me close with a little quintessentially American story that I use, usually use at the end of my town hall meetings. I've had almost 1,100 of them at home. The historians had a big debate about it, and now apparently they have given to Abe Ibn, the uh, Israeli diplomat, the uh, development of the theory, but apparently one day Abe Ibn said to a group of people, the Americans always get it right. And then he paused and he said, after they've tried everything else. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Wyden. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. That was great. Um, that was very cool and a perfect, uh, perfect uh, sort of segue for what we were just talking about. We did have a question, um, and I sort of called on you, and I want to make sure we get to it, and then we'll break for the panel. So this will be it, but please, if Thank you, please Daniel. go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Doris Marlin retired Department of Defense, last position with the Office of Energy, Energy Assurance. Primarily, I'm directing my question to Dep Deputy Moreno. And I want to first of all thank you and your staff for a wonderful tour that I had at the Solar and Wind Lab at NRO. Um, my question is, what is the path and when can we get to the next generation of scalable flow storage batteries that take us beyond the lithium and similar types of storage that require socially and environmentally destructive mineral extraction. Alejandro, you can have that first, and if anyone else wants a, a stab at uh, it, Cheryl, JC looking at you. Well, you, you've managed to hit on one of the few technologies that actually isn't in the ERE, um, so I'll do my best to talk for our Office of Electricity, which covers all of the flow battery work. Um, but really, it depends on the use case. Um, you're know, looking at um, you know, whether you're talking about storage for vehicles, whether you're talking about sort of four hour or less storage to really cover, um, shift the peak for solar generation into the evening hours when that, that uh, electricity is most needed, or you're looking for really longer duration applications, um, the chemistries that you look at are gonna be different. I think we have really strong research into flow batteries. I can't give you a date. I don't know if my colleagues in EERE could, or I'm sorry, in, in the Office of Electricity could give you a date for flow batteries, but the technology is improving um, very much every, every year. Um, but also wanna make the point that even for other chemistries that aren't flow batteries, that are improvements on lithium chemistries or new um, variants that have some of the same capabilities, a big part of the work that EERE does in our vehicles office, um, in our advanced manufacturing office, is looking at developing new chemistries that don't require materials that are predominantly not found in the US or found in very limited supplies or where the supply chain can easily be controlled. And of course, not using materials that require um, really destructive environmental practices in order to, to obtain. So those are critical priorities for DOE. Thanks, Alejandro. Uh, JC, Cheryl, others, do you have any other comments you'd like yeah, to add? I, listen, uh, the industry's chasing the holy grail, right? Lithium, at, at some point, is, is cost-constrained beyond four, six hours, right? So as Alejandro said, eight, 10, 12. 
you know, Iron Air is one that's out there that's being bench tested. They're building a huge facility in West Virginia. They have utility um, uptake in, in the southeast um, through a couple of very large investor owns that are buying the technology. So I think there's the impetus is out there. There's the money to do it. I think it's just an issue in a matter of um, how long does it take. And as you've heard the word reliable thrown around a lot, um, can it be done reliably? And I think once that happens in a reliable and cost-effective way, it really is a game changer because then it's not just as it's not just shaving the peaks, right? It's actually I I got wind that runs during the the evening hours. I can actually effectively and cost-effectively use those electrons later into the morning. Like it's it just really does change the game, but it's just not quite there yet. And I think that you know in the next couple of years we're going to see a lot of this come about. If I can just add, you know, completely agree. In terms of we're clear path, we're working on to ensure the innovation, the funding stays there, keeps flowing there, and as well through the tax policy. So those are very important, important things. Thank you so much, Alejandro, Lisa, JC, Bryn, and Cheryl. Thank you for being great panelists. You're all welcome back. You've all passed. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone was on the edge of your seats. Did they, did they do good enough? Of course they did, they were awesome. And I encourage folks who want to uh, spend a little bit more time with their organizations, check out the exhibit area over in the Rayburn foyer. Um, at, uh, if you have a little uh, hunger and maybe a little thirstiness at five o'clock, we're also having a reception. So everyone of course is invited to join us uh, on the panel and in the audience. We have about six or so minutes. I see most of the next panel in the back of the room. So we have about six or so minutes to transition. Thank you again for being awesome panelists. and. Uh, I'll see you around. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we all